Hi, welcome back. My name is Anand and this is part 2 of a digital study of David. In this video, we'll take David's head that we have already modeled and attach a body to it. And then we'll take our sculpting a little further along. So here's the head that we modeled in part 1. The mesh is rather dense and triangulated. I guess it's okay to continue the dynamic workflow that we've been following, but I prefer to have an organized base mesh as my starting point and then build my subdivision levels from there so that I can go back to any of the lower subdivision levels if I need to. Now, obviously there are ways to snap or wrap my base mesh onto the sculpt, but we are not going to do that here because we are not aiming at creating an animatable production model. Instead, what we'll try to do is build a low resolution version of our head sculpt and join it with the body. Now we have deleted the head part of the base mesh and we'll make a duplicate of the sculpt and use Z ray measure to downres it. We'll try a value of one on the poly count, which means the resultant mesh will have around 1000 polygons. I think it came out okay. I don't like the mesh on the mouth and the eyes though. Let's try again with a higher value. We'll try 2, which translates to roughly 2000 polygons. This is much better. The eyes and mouth look okay and good resolution overall. But unfortunately this is probably not gonna work for us because it doesn't match the resolution on the body. So I guess we'll make some compromises and go for a lower resolution. We'll try again with 0.7. Alright, it's not a great looking mesh, but I think it will match the resolution on the body. Deleting the bottom on the neck in preparation for joining with the body. Delete hidden and then merge down so the whole thing is one sub tool now. We're going to try and use the Z modeler brush for this next part. It's not something that is usually part of my toolkit, but uh, this may be a good opportunity to try it. The Z modeler brush has different context menus depending on where your cursor is. So if you press spacebar while your mouse is over a vertex, it'll give you options related to vertices. We'll choose the stitch option in this case. Now we can click on two vertices to stitch them together. To move vertices, you press spacebar again and choose the move option. Alright, it looks like we have an extra vertex on the head part of the mesh. It's usually a good idea to avoid triangles, but maybe we can make a compromise here and hope nothing breaks. A bit of cleanup at the joint. And now we are ready to subdivide and project. So what we are doing is adding four or five levels of subdivision and then snapping the mesh to the sculpt at each subdivision level. It's almost like shrink wrap in Blender. So now we have five levels of subdivision and uh, looks like we have an exact match with the sculpt. We don't need the original sculpt anymore since we have all the details on the base mesh. A little bit of cleanup at the neck. Adding some of the anatomy back onto the neck. I think we discussed the sternocleidomastoid muscle in part one.
All right, now this is why you shouldn't have triangles on your model. You'll always get a little bump to remind you that you got lazy and left a triangle there. It's actually okay to leave a triangle or two, but make sure it is somewhere not very obvious, like behind the ear or somewhere. All right, now we have a unified base mesh with nice regular topology and five levels of subdivision. I wouldn't use it for animation, but uh, it's good for rendering once you do the UVs and everything. Now I want to get some more sculpting done before we get David into his pose. Take the hands for example. I definitely don't want to sculpt each hand separately. So we have to make use of symmetry while we can. Okay, so this may not be the ideal mesh for sculpting hands. I made this base mesh a long time ago and I may not have taken everything into consideration. I wish it didn't have those extra edge loops at the joints because it may cause some stretching issues. It's probably not going to cause too much trouble so I'm not going to take it back into my or blender to fix it. So we are building a little bit of volume overall. We have moved past the blocking now and getting into a little bit of anatomy here laying out some of those tendons coming in from the forearm. It's important that the knuckles line up to form an arch and not a straight line. Same with the other joints as well. The space between the fingers can get a little tricky. If you observe your own hands, you'll find that the skin kind of slopes down from the knuckle area to the webbing between your fingers. You can use the all prevalent golden ratio for the distance between the joints or use any two consecutive numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. 5 is to 8 or 8 is to 13 or 13 is to 21 and so on. I usually just look at my own hands. That works too. flattening the top of the fingers a little. The cross-section of the fingers are more rectangular than circular, which makes sense because the flat sides fit together properly when the fingers are together. Some little adjustments to the alignment. See, this is why I like to work with a low resolution base mesh. It's easier to make changes quickly. Let's try bending those fingers into a more relaxed pose. It's important to note where the actual bend happens and how the surrounding tissue is affected, especially the skin. Usually you can't go too wrong if you find out where the exact skeletal joint is and place your pivot there. The good news is that you don't have to really search for reference on this. You always have your own hands in front of you. You just have to try a few poses and observe how they move.
we don't see either of david's palms in the original but it's definitely fun to sculpt and uh, a learning opportunity that shouldn't be overlooked adding a couple of tendons going over the thumb coming from those extensor muscles in the forearm that little bump there is called the styoid process of the ulna the ulna being one of the two bones in the forearm It's definitely worth looking at some reference at this point for the knuckles and all the other joints in the hand. There are a few different kinds of tissues here. The skeletal joints of course can be quite prominent depending on the type of body. And then there are these tendons coming in from all the extensive muscles and the so-called interosseous muscles between the metacarpals. Then there's the skin between the fingers which can take different forms depending on the type of hand and the pose if you're sculpting a hand for the first time it's a good idea to lean pretty substantially on some anatomical text and reference material but otherwise you'll do just fine looking at your own hand and the original sculpture The base of the thumb on the palm or side is uh, pretty heavily padded by a group of flexor muscles. These are obviously used for flexing the thumb or in other words curling the thumb thereby enabling us to hold on to things. And the extension of the thumb is achieved as we discussed before by the extensor muscles in the forearm. Their tendons are usually quite visible right above the thumb on the outer side. It's interesting how some of these tendons go around the joint to attach to the bone. Coming down to the fingernails, I'm using the damn standard brush to sculpt the grooves around them. You can always use the clay brush to add some volume or layering there are no particular anatomical rules for the skin folds between the fingers it's mostly observational and you'll notice that it somewhat behaves like cloth. It's always fun to sculpt palms. It's something that you look at every day but you rarely notice its mechanics and how it affects the skin formation. For example, the line that separates the fingers from the palm is something that is easy to get wrong. It doesn't fall directly opposite to the knuckles but is offset about a centimeter outwards. The next two lines under it are what fall directly opposite to the knuckles. Some call them the headline and the heart line. They start on almost the same spot on the opposite sides of the palm and then cross each other without meeting, one turning upwards and the other turning downwards. I'm speeding up the video here. getting into those skin folds and creases again 
some can be so deep that you can see the skin rising up on either side remember that the skin between the fingers or the webbing as we call them behave like cloth and they change with every movement of the fingers you can't really work on them without taking the hand gesture into consideration refining the fingernails a bit more We don't see a lot of veins in the photo reference but then the photos aren't that clear and it stands to reason that Bernini may have added a few here and there so I'm going to go ahead and sculpt a few Alright, it looks like the hands are in fairly good shape now. We'll leave them in this relaxed neutral pose for now and come back to them later and uh, work a bit more on the pose. Now, going back to the drawing board for a second before we sculpt the arms. It's always a good idea to sketch out a plan and work on the proportions beforehand. You can always use the golden section to position the joints. It gives your proportions a certain amount of uh, believability and then there is the principle of opposing curves which is a device that is generally used in figure drawing the idea is that the curves formed by the muscles on opposite sides of the arm do not coincide rather they overlap with each other all right we are starting on the arms now at subdivision level 1 We'll try to get the overall volume and the proportions right before getting into more of the anatomy. And it's a good time to refer back to your drawings and any other reference material. The elbow is uh, an interesting and complex joint. Three bones are involved: the humerus on the upper arm and the radius and ulna in the forearm. The main bony projection that we generally refer to as the elbow is actually the top end of the ulna. and on either side of it you can feel the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus that is to say the two protrusions at the end part of the humerus most of the muscles on the forearm facilitate movement of the hand and fingers the muscles on the outer side usually extend the fingers and muscles on the inner side flex the fingers you can actually feel the two sides of your forearm tightening up alternately when you clench and unclench your fists The back of the forearm will usually feel very hard and bony because there are no muscles covering the ulna there. Moving on to the upper arm, there are 
three main areas on the upper part of the arm we'll call them the biceps area the triceps area and the shoulder area there are of course many other muscles in the upper arm but we'll keep it simple and sculpt them as groups rather than individual muscles speaking of the biceps it has two heads as the name suggests both of them originate all the way up in the upper section of the scapula believe it or not they then cross the shoulder area into the front part of the humerus where it has the most bulk and then insert on the radius there are a few more muscles in the same area working in tandem with the biceps we will not be discussing them separately in this video but i would strongly recommend studying them using an anatomy book or online reference that's the medial epicondyle an important landmark on the elbow most of the flexor muscles for the hands and fingers originate from it The lateral epicondyle on the other side is less obvious in comparison and most of the extensor muscles for your hands and fingers originate from it. It's overlapped by the brachioradialis and a few other muscles. Now we come to the triceps, the official extender of the arm. It acts as a counterpart to the biceps. The biceps flexes your arm while the triceps extends it. In common terms, you could say that the biceps and the triceps are used for curling and straightening your arm respectively. The triceps has three heads as the name suggests. Two of them originate in the humerus itself and one from the upper part of the scapula. The end point or the point of insertion is the elbow or the top extremity of the ulna. The shoulder muscle or deltoid technically speaking probably gets its name from the Greek letter delta and it's shaped like an inverted triangle, cone or pyramid depending on which way you look at it. The wider top part of it wraps around the shoulder joint originating in three separate places the clavicle, the acromion process of the scapula and the spine of the scapula. And of course it inserts on the humerus. Its obvious function is to rotate the humerus upward or raise the arm. We come to the scapula now. The orientation of the scapula differs widely depending on the position of the arm. As we'll no doubt observe when we work on David's pose. There are of course a number of smaller muscles originating from and riding on top of the scapula and attaching to the humerus. The infraspinatus, the teres major and minor, etc. Inserting on the spine of the scapula and the acromion process is the trapezius muscle and passing over the lower part of the scapula is the latissimus dorsi attaching on to the humerus. Beneath the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi is a group of muscles called the erector spinae. They originate on the lower spine and insert on different parts of the spine and the ribcage. They serve as the extensor muscles for different sections of the spine. And also they assist in the lateral or side to side flexion of the torso. On the side we have the external oblique. More on that later. And in the front we have the abs or the rectus abdominis. It's a single muscle running from the ribcage to the pelvis. It has eight sections though, six of them above the navel. Of course you have heard them referred to as the six pack. A brief word about volume and proportion while we're working on the torso. There are three main structural elements in the torso, the spinal column, the ribcage and the pelvis. The spine is made up of four curved sections. First, the forward sweep of the cervical area or the neck. Second is the bigger backward sweep of the thoracic area or the upper torso. 
then the lumbar section which is a smaller forward sweep the last is the sacral bone which is a partial backward sweep these curves obviously give the spinal column its structural stability and the strength that it needs to support the torso and the head the rib cage of course protects the heart the lungs and other vital organs in the upper torso and aesthetically it provides most of the volume and shape of the upper torso the pelvis is of course the fulcrum for all movement of the body any tilt or rotation of the pelvis can be pivotal to the gesture or pose of your figure you'll find that the pelvis and the rib cage are usually tilted in opposite directions when in pose it's referred to as contrapposto in aesthetic studies revisiting the external oblique it's interesting how it extends on to the rib cage interspersing with sections of the serratus anterior note that we are keeping all the muscle indications subtle in this case because we are not sculpting a bodybuilder david is obviously quite well built and athletic but not a bodybuilder the iliac crest is the top part of the pelvis and an important landmark Now we're just going over everything once again, making sure all the parts fit together. We are on to the chest muscles now, the main one being the pectoralis major. It's a big muscle and it has origin points all over the place. The clavicle, the sternum and the cartilage in the midsection of the rib cage. It inserts on the humerus. You'll notice that the humerus has a lot of muscle insertions. That's because a good percentage of the upper body muscles are used for rotating the humerus this way or that in one axis or another. a quick trip to the drawing board again the principle of opposing curves can be used for the legs as well and you might as well use the golden section to place the knee all right now back to sculpting i guess we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy here the thigh bone or the femur is the largest bone in the body the top end of it is shaped like a ball and it fits into a socket in the pelvis. In front of the femur is the quadriceps which is a group of four muscles. They go all the way from the iliac crest to the patella, the kneecap, where it is attached through a tendon. The patella is a small block of bone matter which rests on top of the joint between the femur and the tibia. It acts almost like a pulley to transfer the action of the quadriceps to the lower leg because it is attached to the tibia through a tendon. On the inner side of the femur we have the adductor muscles which bring the legs together. The lower leg has two bones, the tibia and the fibula. We have already mentioned the tibia which is the bigger one. It's also called the shin bone. The tibia is rather exposed in the front. You can actually feel the bone right under the skin. The back on the other hand has considerably more muscle mass covering it. You have the two-headed muscle called the gastrocnemius, strange name, and one right underneath it called the soleus. They both insert on the heel bone through, you guessed it, the Achilles tendon. The knee joint is somewhat exposed, just like the elbow. You can feel the kneecap right under the skin and also the head part of the tibia. It's quite a busy area though, a lot of tendons and other tissue. We are trying to stay as close as possible to David, although the sculpting is definitely based on anatomy. I'm probably not doing it consciously or well, but I think the process is to 
read the master's work but through what you know about the real anatomy some adjustments to the general proportion and the bigger shape of the leg working on the side of the pelvic area maybe we should get some real reference at this point there you go let's hide the arms for a better view as you can see in the drawing you have the tensor fasciae latae the small muscles starting from the front of the iliac crest and then you have the gluteus medius and the gluteus maximus in the back all three of them insert on the femur but some of their fibers attach on the iliotibial band which then inserts on the tibia there are a few important muscles on the outer side of the lower leg covering the fibula their functions are mostly related to the movements of the foot and the toes as always making some general adjustments to the shape sculpting a little more detail on the back of the leg we already discussed the soleus and the gastrocnemius on the back of the thigh we have the biceps of the leg or technically biceps femoris it has origin points on the pelvis as well as the femur on the inner side you have the semi tendinosus the semi membranosus and all the rest of the adductor muscles now it's time to go over everything again and uh, add more refinement and definition while working on the ankle joint be aware that the outer protrusion is actually the end portion of the fibula and the inner protrusion represents the end part of the tibia and they are not on the same level because the fibula extends a little lower than the tibia The ankle is actually a complicated joint. There are a bunch of blocky little bones there. The main one being the talus which sits right underneath the tibia and the fibula. Then there's the heel bone or calcaneus. I know we are going over things all over again, sometimes redoing things. but that's how it is sculpture is typically done in several passes sometimes you have to go over the same area multiple times to get it right
So now we are down to the foot. We will start off by posing the toes a little better. Adding some volume as we go, as appropriate. It's interesting how everything fits together so well in the real world. Every toe has a little space between the first and second joints where the head of the next toe can fit in snugly. Undoubtedly millions of years of evolution has gone into shaping these things. So we have raised the subdivision level and uh, Sculpting a little more detail. It's mostly the tendons going into the toes from the muscles on the lower leg. I apologize for not going into the anatomical details here. Just trying to stay close to the original David. But if you're interested in seeing an Ecosia sculpt of the foot, please do let me know. I'll be happy to make a video of that. For the toenails, we are using pretty much the same method that we used for fingernails. Using the damn standard brush to sketch in the outline and the move brush to make adjustments. I have to use masking here because the toes are so close together. Just carving in the arch of the foot and some more refinement of the heel and as always going over everything once again making sure everything is in balance. Going over the ankle joint again as we mentioned it's almost all bones and tendons I don't think there is any muscle at all in the foot, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, studying the anatomy is essential, but you should realize that that's not the whole deal. A lot of your aesthetic choices in sculpture should come from observation. And that's one reason why sculptors should do a lot of figure drawing. Try to attend live figure drawing sessions in your area if possible, but if those are not available then you can use online references. There are hundreds of websites for artists with instructional videos and reference images. Alright, I think we have gone far enough with the neutral pose. Maybe at this point we should post David and see what happens. Alright folks, that's it for part 2 of Sculpting David. Stay tuned for part 3 where we pose him and sculpt him further. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.